Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for attending April's uh, Inner Circle. I know I've said hello to some of you, but not to others, but we'll get round to everybody, I promise. Um, hope everybody had a lovely weekend and is enjoying a bit more freedom. But so we can kick off, let's start with uh, Michael Newman. Tell us a little bit about you, Michael, uh, for people who don't know, and your business. Okay, there's a couple of people on here who do know me, just have the misfortune. Uh, I run an HR business. I work primarily with small and medium-sized companies providing outsourced HR support. I've been doing this for about 15 years. I'm based in Loughton in Essex, but my clients are all over the south of England. Great stuff. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Paul, tell us a little bit about you. Right. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Halston. I run a company called Corporate Council, um, so that's a business um, advisory service, and um, I go into companies and help them on an interim basis to, uh, to, to, to grow and sometimes to exit. So uh, and unlike a coach, I actually go in and help them do the work, so we make sure things happen. And uh, yes, that's me. Thank you. Great stuff. Thanks a lot. For me, then? Uh, I'm a court protection solicitor and basically I deal with um, people who lack capacity and basically manage their finances and make applications to the court. So Great stuff. We are, we are sort of rocking through these. No, no filler today. No filler today. Not happening. Uh, Alex, tell us a little bit about you. Uh, 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 so again, uh, Alex Pierce, um, Senior Associate, Police Health and Solicitors, uh, Employment Lawyer, Act both employees and employers dealing with sort of contentious and sort of non contentious matters. Amazing. I, you guys are going to need, need to teach me how to be that concise because I, I can never manage it. Raymond, <laughs> tell us a little bit about you. Uh, yeah. Raymond Holt, Evening Enterprise Partners. Um, I work with small business owners to build their businesses with their families, um, helping business owners engage with their partners and children to understand how the business they're building and achieves their business their family aspirations. Great stuff. Thank you, mate. Really appreciate that. Janet, tell us a little bit about you. Hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, Janet Smythe, um, so it's small business accountant uh, specialising um, small businesses, uh, limited companies, uh, sole traders, uh, right to manage, community interest companies, all that sort of bag. Um, yeah, that's us supporting Good stuff. We are on a we are on a roll. To, clearly, this case study needs a lot of discussion because we're leaving enough time for it. Um, Friday, uh, how are you, mate? I'm very good, thanks, Chris. Nice good to stuff. see you guys. Some familiar faces and some new ones here, actually, as usual. Yeah. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, what do I do? Uh, I work with grey head, silver head, no head generations from 55 plus who are transiting from career or business into exit into a later life. Amazing, great stuff. Thanks, Pradeep. Thank it's Forsdyke, how are you? Very well, sir. How are you doing? Really good, thanks. Really good. Tell us a little <laughs> bit about you. Uh, so I run um, what's known as the Later Life Finance team at uh, Knight Frank Finance. Uh, we specialise in helping um, <clears throat> high net worth uh, high net worth clients who are uh, on average around about 75 years old. So um, later life you can interpret that as you wish but uh, our average clients around about 75 and we help them with a number of um, borrowing solutions typically secured against their property so that includes things like uh, equity release and uh, other forms of mortgage finance uh, and also a very fancy thing called Lombard lending, but we don't do a huge amount of that. Um, so yes, later life finance, if you've got older clients or older members of the family who needs a, a helping hand, uh, that's what we're here for. Oh, good stuff. And Lombard lending I've written down because I don't know much about that. So Neither do education. I. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I was going to ask you. So I, I don't, between us, we might be able to work it yeah, out. Yeah, I'm joking. Um, uh, Toby. Talk to, to me about what's going on in your world. Hi, everyone. Good to see some uh, regulars and to uh, see some new people here. Uh, Toby Acton. I'm a personal business mentor and trainer. I basically help business owners to get wealthy faster. I inspire, educate, support them to help them get from where they are to where they want to be as fast as possible and really truncate that journey. Amazing. Thanks, Steph. Thanks. Great stuff. Terry, how are you, mate? Very well. Good stuff. Tell us a little bit. 
tell us a little bit about you. I'll see some familiar faces and a few new ones as well. So um, Terry Upper, I'm a regional partner for WPA. If you've not heard of us before, we're a not-for-profit private medical insurance company. So we provide medical insurance solutions for individuals, families, all the way through to employee benefit schemes for, for large companies. So that's me done. Um, I almost had time for a zip of tea there, Terry. Thanks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I saw Kevin. you pick the cup up. <laughs> you, were, you, were you just waiting for me to do it? <laughs> so, Kevin, tell us a little bit about you, mate. I do apologise for me floating in and floating out, so that's how I call it. Good morning, no good afternoon, gents and ladies. Uh, Lakes Life Landing Specialists, you are very fortunate to have two of the probably most experienced Lake Life Landing Specialists on this one webinar. Good afternoon, David. Just, uh, Hi, quite, Kevin. Good to see you again. Uh, basically, I run Lakes Life Landing Solutions. We're a company of eight brokers, um, myself being a director and partner, and we're trying to provide a more of a niche personal solution for clients of late life. Cool, oh, thanks Kevin. And last but definitely not least, Paul, how are you mate? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. Um, yeah, I, I, as you can see, I work with uh, uh, properties overseas. Um, we help people both buy and sell properties if they uh, are interested in Spain. Um, and increasingly we're looking at Portugal as well. Amazing, great stuff. And, uh, Certainly, there's going to be loads of, I mean, we've got a bunch of amazing experts in the room with loads of really good insight. So without further ado, let's uh, crack on with our case study. And I'm just going to quickly share my screen um, just to show you what the, um, I know you've all got a copy of this, but because this goes out on LinkedIn and YouTube and stuff like that, this is to make sure that anybody watching knows what we're talking about. So, uh, so that uh, inner circle is all about us talking about a real life um, practical case study, typically based on um, on one of my clients. Um, uh, apart from the fact that clearly, or sometimes not clearly, there's an 80s reference involved in there somewhere. Um, so let's just talk about um, let's just talk about this particular client and see uh, where you can apply a particular insight. Uh, Martin and Shirley have been married for 28 years. Started a computer company and IT business back in the late 90s, and that's grown significantly. Shirley runs the ops, and Martin runs the sales team. Uh, the business started primarily as a, a supporting companies to navigate the potential risks of the millennium bug, which is something I've not heard for about for a while, but was quite prevalent um, a couple of decades ago. Um, uh, but has then expanded their services to include hardware and software and platform building and all sorts of good stuff. Uh, based in Chelmsford and employs 35 people. Um, and um, since the first lockdown, uh, everybody's been working from home quite well, but with the exception of about a couple of members of staff who, who couldn't work from home and therefore came back into the office. Uh, they've had a good year commercially, um, uh, but this has meant that as they expand and grow, Martin and Shirley have been concerned about the quality of their work and their reputations, um, particularly because they've had to outsource or they've made the decision to outsource to manage capacity. And the other thing they're concerned about is turnovers increased, but profits haven't. So uh, they're not they're not sure why that's happened. Uh, Martin struggled a bit personally during lockdown because um, all of the fun bits of the job, um, the bits where he gets to go out and about with his clients, they've been taken away. So um, uh, he's getting a bit like probably like a lot of us, a little bit zoomed out. Um, and is trying to sort of navigate mentally around that. Shirley has enjoyed lockdown a bit more, um, but has been using the time to consider what uh, their future looks like, because um, she feels like she's missed out time with kids and grandkids, um, and wants to make sure that they are um, uh, moving forward, uh, seeing more of them. Um, and again, they're looking at the situation at the minute where, where in this new environment where people are working more flexibly, how do we manage our teams and make sure we sort of maintain motivation? Um, and Martin's, Martin's, you know, because he's a people person and wants people back in the office, 
he wants to understand what he can do to either compel or encourage people to come back into, into work. One of the challenges uh, many of their clients face is um, this element of maintaining confidential information, particularly on their home computers, and Martin doesn't know what the rules are on, on that. Shirley um, made the point that pr productivity actually has improved from home, but they don't measure productivity in any sort of meaningful way um, and wonder how they can do this. Um, and they're also thinking about business value. You know, profits have gone up. How do they calculate business value, particularly if it's part of their um, exit plan? Um, uh, they feel they're really good at getting work through existing business clients and referrals, uh, but they're thinking about other sources of marketing and what they might do about that. Um, and Martin and Shirley believe that they've only got enough money for their retirement if they sell their business, but want more clarity. Uh, Martin and Shirley have got no wills, uh, I'm sorry, had wills, but no power of attorneys in place. Um, and they've also been thinking about putting some of their money to trust, but want to understand um, whether they've got an uh, inheritance tax issue as we sit today. Uh, and one element Mark, Mark and Shirley are struggling with is, you know, they've got this business value, but it's their baby. So what do they do in terms of um, emotionally removing themselves from, from what, they've, um, what they've already built? Martin's mum, Soraya, is in a position where she's also considering, considering her options. She's thinking about selling and downsizing to release capital, but is wondering whether a lifetime mortgage may be suitable. Um, and she's asset rich, but cash poor, uh, so she's low on um, savings, um, but worries that if she decides to sell at some point in the future, what options she's got in terms of that. As always, any mistakes, errors or omissions are 100% intentional, I do it on purpose, clearly. Um, <laughs> but um, the three key questions we're going to talk through um, uh, initially, is what, from your particular professional perspective, what extra information would you like to know to have a clearer situation of Martin Shirley or Soraya's uh, situation to support them to make the right decisions? Let's start with Michael. Thank you. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> that didn't sound genuine, Michael. Start something else. <laughs> oh, that's all right. I was thinking about a couple of things. First thing he's uh, worrying about how to, firstly, about getting people back to work. He's got a problem there because the current government advice is to still work from home. So he can't compel people to come back to work. He's got to persuade and cajole. And one of the things he has to do is to make sure he's up to date with his health and safety risk assessments to me, it's such, such that he's as COVID secure as he should be. And the other issue he's got to be with, he's got 35 people in Chelmsford, how are they going to get to work? What is he going to do to say, ameliorate their fees of going on public transport? Is he going to bring in staggered start and finish times? Is he going to allow them to work outside? rush out, you know, come and go outside rush hours to reduce the risk. Uh, does he have, then, for the guys that are working at home, does he have a home working policy? Has he done a virtual risk assessment of their workstations? Does he know if they've got the correct equipment at home, chairs, tables, Wi-Fi? Are they using his equipment or their own equipment? And if they're using their own equipment at home, what steps is he taking to maintain confidentiality to make sure the kids aren't by mistake getting into his computer and also what he doesn't appear to know anything about gdpr so that's kind of a bit, that seems to be a bit of an issue that's a, that's an open so that's a couple of things i would immediately think about i'm sure alex would think of a few more things that i've forgotten about oh. So that's something to be going on. That, that's on the HR business side of it. On the other side, I'm not qualified to comment, really. Uh, the only thing I would say in terms of the overall business, we need to know how which percentage of the business each client actually represents and what profitability each client represents. So he's got an overall picture of where he's really going. And 
if he doesn't like going out and seeing people, that's just the world we're in because it's never going to change completely anyway. It, it will not go back to what it was. There will be a mixture of people looking at each other at little boxes like we are today and going out for the odd drink. The other thing he could do, sorry, just other two things he could do is first, he needs to worry about the mental health of people being at home. He needs to invest in some active mental health awareness training and he needs to build some kind of team spirit within the group by having weekly team meetings, even if it is on Zoom, and getting making sure everyone knows what's going on and everyone feels that they're part of the group. That is really yeah. important. Yeah. So yeah. I'll shut up now. That's really, really good. And I think that maintaining that community even during lockdown as, and being as part of the team is a, is a really good point. Paul, talk to me about what other questions you might want to ask uh, Mike and Shirley and Soraya. Is that me or Paul? Paul Vosden. Oh, thank you. <laughs> right. Um, yes, um, a couple of things. I think um, the fact that they are a bit uncertain about their profit, um, they obviously need probably, and we have a very good accountant here on this call, to actually look at that and just say, well, what's going on? Because, you know, there's no point just turning over if you're not making any money. Um, and another thing was a bit worrying um, for their age. I know they said they were doing for inheritance tax purposes. They're thinking of doing equity release for themselves. Now, for example, for their mother, um, mother-in-law, uh, who might be older and looking to release cash. But if they're doing it at that age, perhaps they're a bit uncertain about have they really done an exercise to look at what uh, their retirement, if that's what they're thinking about, actually looks like. So I think they need a bit of a sort of, uh, you know, half day workshop or something, just looking at all these aspects, you know, being very, very uh, clear with themselves about where they want to go, uh, how much they need, when do they want to get up. And if they want to sell the business, some sort of succession plan, um, who would take it over, um, where they might go. Um, one of the interesting areas, I think, is, <clears throat> is I think Mother just said everyone's going digital. Um, is the number of smaller businesses are just actually just not really digitally active. They they'd like to be smaller shops, smaller restaurants. <clears throat> They've all been a lot of people have done very well with takeaway, but a lot of them just haven't got a clue. They you know it's just not in their bag. So there may be a product for them there to actually go and talk to some of these people, and they may even get funding for that from local authorities who are encouraging more um, uh, you know. Or activity back to say everyone should actually have a digital strategy. That's very much the way of it. So yeah, I think it's about sitting down, having a plan, um, and just mapping out where they're going to go to. Um, and, and yes, as Michael said, we, we are probably going to stay for quite a while in this uh, virtual world. But I do think there is some pressure uh, to go back to offices again. Um, one of the big um, merchant banks has said that they want their staff to go back in for two reasons. One is <clears throat> they feel that uh, there's a mental health issue. <laughs> they, they would be happier, uh, you know, in a obviously a socially distanced way, meeting people or seeing people. But, uh, but secondly, it is a real issue about how do you control the productivity? How do you control the thing? And how do you capture those water cooler moments, as they say in the States, <laughs> about, you know, things that come instinctively. So I think... Whilst everyone's saying we won't go back to it, I, I think there will be a gradual easing back into, into offices. Um, it, and it's Michael's right, it won't be anywhere near like it was. But there's a huge pent up demand. For people, uh, The number of people I've talked to say, oh, I'm going in for a meeting, as you just said. It's a, it's a treat, isn't it, to go out and actually see things. So I think they should be aware of that. But sorry, I've been going on a bit longer there. Yeah, so, but, but you're right. It, it's, it's, it's where the balance is going to sit. And it's exactly. what we don't know, exactly. do yeah. we? That's the. Yeah. That's a challenge. I think you're right as well, Paul. It's you know taking all of these component parts and getting clear on what the next ten years of their yep. life look like. Exactly, um, yep. and that's certainly something we'd support them to do at, mm. at yep. Cervelo. Uh, for me now, talk to me about what additional questions you'd you'd ask. Um, um, my questions would be to Soraya, um, basically yep. why she's looking to downsize, um, whether she lives alone, um, can she manage on her own. Um, if she was to downsize and um, also does she understand what um, a lifetime mortgage is are there any other options such as a care facility and um, depending obviously on her mental capacity as well yeah. um, so basically it's all centered around Soraya 
um, she could consider um, equity release for a current property. So if it is capital that she's looking for. So it's, again, it's all centered around Soraya due to because of her age. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, is there some big unknowns there in terms of a situation that might have an impact on, on, on where you'd, what you'd recommend, right? Yeah, so basically if she does have um, issues with mental capacity, then it depends on basically whether she is able to manage. So if she's not able to manage, then there's no reason for her to be basically downsizing, yes. maybe moving to a care home. Yeah, I mean, one thing I don't think I've put in the case study um, is whether she's got PLAs. Um, I know we know that Martin and Shirley haven't, but we don't know about Soraya. So, uh, you know, as you thought about this sort of stuff, and I suppose is there some value in considering PLAs if her mental capacity is good? Um, yes. Um, well, basically, if she wants a lasting power of attorney and she does have capacity, then, yeah, I mean, but the thing is, again, it all can basically comes down to her moving home. <clears throat> basically downsizing yeah. that's something that it, it would need to be discussed with the social workers as well if she doesn't have capacity and there's attorneys in place yeah spell great stuff thank you so much for that and we'll come back on a couple of uh, interesting points you raised later on in the in the conversation alex talk to me about your thoughts in terms of what more you'd want to know from your perspective so I think firstly, I'd probably want to know whether they've got sort of the basics in place. So, I mean, do they have contracts of employment for those 35 odd members of staff? Because obviously you'd normally expect sort of confidential information or confidentiality clauses in a contract of employment. Very important if you're working in the office or away from the office. Things like the return of company property. If you're sending out laptops to all your staff working from home, you want to make sure that there's at least a contractual right for, you, for them to return the property rather than relying upon other ways. Is there a staff handbook or a director services agreements in place? Just the real building blocks before you start moving on to uh, things like I said, so is there a, a working from home policy in place? Um, do they believe that uh, their staff will be sort of making applications for flexible working? Flexible working can include essentially working part from home. How do they see their staff coming back full time, part time, sort of that hybrid model where I think a lot of organisations are now saying, well, yes, you can do a bit of work from home. That, that's fine by us. But we do want you to be in the office for two or three days a week. How is that actually going to work in practice? Um, will they need to recruit additional staff? They've talked about outsourcing a lot of this work and that work hasn't been up to the standard. Are they actually looking to... Um, retail recruit and then retain those sort of additional staff um and i guess another, another question is are they going to be encouraging their staff to get sort of the covid19 vaccine um i've certainly noticed that i've had a few employer clients asking for sort of a covid19 vaccination policy in terms of kind of setting out kind of whether it's a requirement or not uh, or basically um trying to alleviate any of those sort of myths etc out there reasonable time off for a vaccine can you, can you, I mean, my understanding is there's no compulsion though, right? You know, in terms no of this stuff. Correct. Um, but, but encouragement is allowed. But so encouragement to say, look, um, yes, you can have reasonable time off to go and get your vaccine, for example. So those type of matters, which um, I guess facilitate good employer employee relationship yeah, yeah. Sort, of, sort of going forward. So I think, yeah, getting the basics correct and make sure they're in place and then building on those basics in terms of, like I say, flexible working, um, I suppose, health and safety issues, et cetera. I suppose one interesting point is why they are sort of seen and not recruiting directly. Yeah, it's you know, the cost, why, for example. Yeah, yeah. potentially. Um, and is that is that outsourcing increasing their cost base? So, and, and one of the reasons mm -hmm. why they're making less profit, because it could be, because that might be a more expensive way of getting the work done, mightn't it? Yeah, potentially yes and you, you have less control over it as well yeah yeah which might account for the drop of quality it's like <laughs> i've written this with intention Alex. <laughs> um raymond talk to me about what questions you'd ask um well let's do the outsourcing one first because i was i put down here 
uh, what were they actually expecting and did they make it clear in the first instance what good quality yeah, yeah. the term looked like um so it's not to give every take over everybody what everyone's going to be asking them so guess i would uh have they considered coaching for the emotional handover of their business um do they have a family plan because it doesn't actually say how old their children are or the circumstances of their children mm -hmm. um with regards to the staff are they are the other are staff what uh, talk about they've got the capacity and everything else to hand down through delegation is that what everybody wants and do they really have the structure and the people really have the structure and the people in place to actually make that work yeah um yeah, the finance bit around looking at the numbers, breaking down and seeing why the money's going. Yeah, I, I, the question I raise is why sell exit has many different versions. And if it's a opportunity maybe to hold on to the business, but take a return from the business rather than sell it because it is an asset, um, maybe that can work. Um, and I think that's it. There's a number, couple of other bits, but that, and so the main thing was about them together, working together to create a plan that, they understand that for them what was important so they actually get the right exit given that given the lifestyle that they want yeah but but potentially why why sell it all and just live on the if, if it can be self managed to a certain extent why not just take the income from it and and have less involvement that's a interesting point thank you Raymond appreciate that mate Janet talk to me about your thoughts ah so, sure I think um it's quite a financial one, this one, isn't it? Because it's uh, it's all sort of around what the business is doing and, um, you know, how to measure that. So I think, you know, that, that would be the most important thing for me to get some real numbers from them. Yeah. Um, and so we can start sort of measuring uh, what's going on, um, looking at the, the key performance indicators on it and um, and seeing where, where the, the trends on that. And I think from that, you can then start thinking about some scenarios and making some decisions. So I think that that would be the first thing I'd be asking would be um, to have a lot more detail on the um, on the numbers side. Um, the other things that I was um, looking at was the security for the um, the working from home um, staff. You know what, what what are they doing in terms of their sort of cyber security on that? Because I mean that's been a you know a challenge for me to make sure you know people I've got working from home are you know my data secure for them. So I think you know again that that'd be a question I would I'd be asking around that. Um, I think the other thing, oh, the other thing I was sort of thinking along the times lines of, you know, if we've got them numbers that we can benchmark them against a similar company to see sort of performance levels um, and, and how they're doing and, and equally looking at what customers are generating most of that income um, and how that then tracks back to which employees are generating that income so i think it's you know it's all all around them that sort of number analysis so you know that's what i'd be I'd be requiring um and then the other things that i think i mean this is probably more your bag chris but there's no um mention on on what their other sort of investments are um in terms of sort of pension or or anything really so doesn't mention it at all does it no no so i think you know <laughs> not i would necessarily do much with it but i would want that information and then to to pass on to yourself <laughs> well, but this is a challenge isn't it i think you know there's all these component parts and we need to take into account every single component part because it all forms part yeah. of their personal plan and what yeah. decisions they need, need to make with other aspects of of, of, of their life yeah, and you're right definitely. I mean I didn't I intentionally didn't put any numbers in this month yeah. um, but certainly we'd want access to the numbers mm. Janet just out of interest what mm. would be like the key component numbers you'd want like yeah I think you know you, you, obviously we you know it's, it's focused on turnover so we're going to look, be looking at you know what's the trend on turnover and, and what's the increase and what's generated that extra turnover so that that's sort of customer numbers and turnover numbers and then looking at the expenses uh, and overhead side and, and like you say with the um you know the cost of the extra um, outsourcing, particularly mm. that's that's going to be of interest. And whether or not, if we we run a scenario, you know, by employing one more member of staff, how much does that save on, um, you know, not outsourcing? And and are we going to still have that level of increase in, yeah. in income? So I think it's all them types of numbers and comparisons that I'd be looking at. Yeah, I, I, I mean, we'll 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 do the round robin and discuss it 
this in a bit more depth in a little while, but I think an interesting conversation to, to have is, you know, I, 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 like this is a really the worst graph you've seen in the world, but that trend of profit and turnover don't all, they no, don't necessarily no. go up at the same rate, do they? No, so no, no, you can't often. managing that process. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we see this quite often with something, something like maybe like care facilities <laughs> where you need to invest in that staff level and your you know, your revenue stays like that and then, then it will go up later yeah. on. But, you know, you always get that sort of line going on. But, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a... But, you know, you want them numbers to make sure that the investment is going to be worthwhile um, before you do it. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, lovely, thank you. Uh, David, talk to me about uh, what you your thoughts were and what extra information you'd want from the case. Thanks, Chris. Um, before I do that, I just want to uh, give an apology to the whole group because I'm going to have to leave you at two o'clock today. Uh, my marketing team decided today would be the day that we launch our first ever uh, Later Life um, quarterly report. Uh, and so they they are hounding me for um, <laughs> input and everything else. Um, so I'm I'm holding them off until two o'clock, but I don't think I'll get away with it beyond that. So oh, no just an apology to everybody for that. Um, uh, secondly, your '80s reference in this case study is is sublime, Mr. Dave. Thank you, mate. Uh, <laughs> uh, I I hope everyone else has caught onto it. But well, you know what, I was wrestling <laughs> with put putting what what to put in there, and I was really struggling yeah. this month. Yeah, well, yeah, you're a uh, you're a genius. It just, yes, it brought back some wonderful memories of my childhood. I have to say, um, the things the things that really stood out to me with this um, coming from from where I come from um, is first of all, you've got a, a couple here who appear to have been very successful, uh, but they are beginning to worry about how all of their finances stack up. So I think the first thing I would want to know is, do they have any uh, borrowing themselves? Yeah. Perhaps they've got um, a residential mortgage on their main residence. Um, are they getting the best deal possible for their own personal borrowing? And then uh, also for the business, does the business have any uh, borrowing involved? And should we be looking at at improving the terms of, of that borrowing, because uh, obviously that can make a huge difference to things like cash flow. Um, the second thing that they're worried about is the, um, the inheritance tax position. So we would want to find out uh, what the value of their estate is. Uh, do they own their business premises, for example? We don't know that, but it would be useful to understand that if they do, um, then it's worth getting that uh, valued um, uh, to understand exactly what their, their asset base looks like. like I mean, one, one important point on that, though, is if, if, the, if the limited company owns the business premises yep. and um, effectively it would sit under the limited company and the limited company, as long as it was an active trading company, would qualify for business property relief. Yeah. Um, so the, 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 the value of that, if it was sold as part of the limited company, wouldn't be part of the IHT calculation. If it was owned individually, if it was owned as the pension, uh, the pension would be within a, a IHT calculation. But if they owned it individually, certainly it would. Yeah. So the ownership on that element is really important. Yeah. So this is why we'd, we'd want to know about you know, whether they own the business premises and as you say, how they own yeah. the business premises, what's the structure that sits behind it. Um, and then thinking about the sort of the later life finance angle on this, um, I think we would need to understand um, what uh, what Martin's uh, mum's um, position is. We would need to go into a bit more detail around her income and her expenditure. Uh, we know she's running low on savings and, and needs a bit of a top up, but exactly what does that look like? Yeah. Um, and uh, she's thinking of selling the property, but I think we'd need to have a conversation with her about what the future looks like, whether downsizing is the sensible option, whether she might need some degree of care going forwards. Yeah. Um, I mean, at age 82, there's plenty of scope there to borrow but whether it's the right thing to do or not would just depend on a, a fairly careful conversation really about what the future might look like for her. Um, it says in the brief, 
um, about whether uh, you know, Martin's worried about inheritance tax planning and whether he should do something himself. I think at their current age, it's probably a bit too early. Um, we deal with a lot of clients who are looking at uh, borrowing as part of an inheritance tax planning regime, but it's typically once they get into their 70s. Uh, so I, I think it's probably a bit too early for them to worry about that. But yeah, we can certainly I mean, help them understand the options. Yeah, I think the other key factor on that is understand whether you're going to have enough before you start worrying about inheritance tax, because exactly, yeah. you know you, you need clarity on your whether whether you've got sufficient capital to be able to live the rest of your life before you, you start worrying yeah, about you that. You don't want to start giving a, giving it away if you're then going to run out later on. Now, I, I suppose <laughs> the other the other big factor is that big unknown of care. You know, I've I've got a client that we do some some work with, and he wanted to, so he's in his early seventies. He wanted to give some money away, no kids, but he wanted to give some money away to his, his sister's children. Mapped out on cash flow, all looked really good for a, quite a substantial gift to reduce the value of his estate. Yeah. As soon as I added care back into the mix, it was a no-no. Yeah. Um, so it's that, it, it's that conversation around whether actually we're taking unnecessary risks by giving money away too early. Um, and, and, and talking about that. So really good. Thanks, David. Really appreciate that. No and if problem. you need to, I'll try and come back to you on the on the next round first so that okay. you can have a little bit of an input. Friday, Thank talk to me about uh, your thoughts. I mean, this is bread and butter for you, mate, isn't it? Uh, tell me about it. I think every case that you've brought, <laughs> every case you've brought here since you started this on a face-to-face -face has always got certain elements for me in there. Um, it's nice to see a lot of people here with a perspective on later life, uh, what next, as you call it, Chris. Uh, for me, there's a lot of questions. Yeah, I'd really like to speak with Martin, Shirley, and Saraya. They've all got their own unique perspective on you know, where they are in life. And I think some of like Paul and David have considered later life, what it means. For this particular case study, there's a lot of things here that's, you know, particularly with the COVID, it's funny how you mentioned the year, millennium year, year 2000, because I was part of that. And, you know, we were all scared of planes falling off the skies because of, you know, the clocks are not designed for the year 2000. So that really brings back some memories, like David. Well, the, the only reason I mention it is because I was, I was working in Holborn. I was working in town uh, in 1998 and 1999. And I remember, and, and I was, I mean, I only did mortgages for like a couple of years, really. I haven't done them for 20 odd years. Um, but um, IT contractors, I remember in that period, had a particular purple patch because everybody was worried about the Millennium Buck. You know, we had so many IT contractors who used to come into, into the city and, and they, they seem to... They seem to have the most amazing time for about four or five years, but that, that's, that's the reason it was mentioned. Oh, they did. I actually went into the YKK preparation, which basically took me back to my school days, learning about IT and the binary number system. Uh, so even in the year 2000, we were still talking about that after so many years. But what this does is, you know, I mean, it shows that they, these guys, Martin and Shirley, have been running this business for 20 plus years, just like your business. Uh, which means that they started with good intention with the Millennium 2000 bugs and what have you. Times have moved on. Uh, they've done extremely well in turnover time, uh, turnover ways uh, at COVID time. But the question they should be asking is the reason for it. Uh, the turnover has gone up, but the profitability hasn't followed. Now, there's two trails of thought here. They are outsourcing now, whereas before they would have been hands-on, which means there's a leak in the, in the business. So they, this is an ideal opportunity for them to think, well, you've had a 20 years of run in this business. Uh, and what it has done is they've become attached to it. And that clearly comes out in your text here where they're saying they're emotionally attached to it and they don't know how to let go. This is a key point in a lot of people in any career you have, you are identified by your profession. And when you don't have that, then what are you? Who are you? This is gonna be a key issue. And I think Shirley is beginning to recognize already that we're struggling. So it's an emotional changeover from uh, running a business to not running a business. So it's a preparation. So when we talk about this particular age, it is an ideal time to start thinking ahead in the next ten, five years to 10 years. And uh, you know, there's a lot of issues that's come out in terms of they're struggling emotionally, the attachment. Uh, they're also talking about 
Well, Martin talked about, you know, he's a hands-on person face to face and the world has changed. You know, I don't think we'll all go back in droves to hug each other and talk to each other and, you know, do the things that we used to do before. It's going to be a very cautious step. So that's going to be another change. And, you know, how you introduce that, even though, you know, this weekend uh, we had the pubs and places opened up, but a lot of them are still shut. We had to find a pub that was open and we had to travel about 15 miles from where we are to go to one. So the world is going to be different. Uh, question I'd be asking certainly is where are they in their health? Because at the moment that doesn't indicate. Yeah. You know, that particular age is so crucial. If your health is compromised, everything else gets on a standstill or a back burner. Yeah. Uh, thinking about moving forward, how would they want to change their life? And if they haven't thought about it, now's the time. What COVID has done is got, to, got a lot of people to think that, you know, if this is going to be a constraint in our life, we're not able to do things, we have to reinvent ourselves. And this is an ideal time to reinvent or rather invent their later life. So the expertise from David, Paul, and all these guys, you know, are key components to help them with it. 100%. But before you get to that stage is, you know, getting their head screwed in properly, asking the right in-depth questions, getting a sense of clarity to mm. move on and then plan ahead. I think I think the, the really interesting point you raised, and it's been raised on the webinars with Cervello has been running over the past couple of months is around um, identity and r effectively how you you know all of the all of the numbers you can put in play and give somebody a plan that explains the logical side but if you've been building something for 20 years and you're known as the owner of that particular business how do you replace that in your life and there's a really good book that I'd recommend um, uh, people reading called Design. I'm not going to mention it loads because I mention it all the time, but yeah. it's called Designing Your Life by Bill Burnett um, that talks about applying design thinking to um, look at what happens next in your life. Certainly worth taking a look. Toby, talk to me about your thoughts and the extra questions you'd have. Yeah, great. Um... Great case study. Lots of information there. It's a bit like looking at a needle in a giant haystack to uh, to get the. Uh, you know what? You know what? Thank you, mate. Uh, you know what? One. Well, I mean, look. You always give loads of insight, but thank you for acknowledging the effort it takes. <laughs> I appreciate that. You, you, you are. You took my. You are, I've been you are the big daddy of Sabella in a circle. You just clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, yeah, so we're all on the same page, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, as Pradi was saying, uh, for me, I'd want some more clarity about what, particularly what Martin really wants, what he wants for himself, what he wants for his business, what he wants for his lifestyle. Same with Shirley, obviously, there's kids and grandchildren. Um, so I'd want some real clarity there. And I think me asking the clarity would help them get clarity. That's what I tend to find. Um, but also, what, what KPIs do they have? They seem to be struggling to know what's going on. You know, turnover's gone up, but profit hasn't gone up. What KPIs have got themselves? Do the team work, who are people who are working at home, do they have KPIs? Um, because, again, they don't seem to be able to monitor their performance and their productivity. So I think they've got to get some KPIs in there. And then I'd, I'd want to have a real deep dive with them and you know, find out, have they spent real time looking at their client avatars? Have they spent time really looking at their what they're offering and their um, their value propositions? And you know, are they those are the things that are appealing to their target clients because they they seem to be struggling on the on the marketing side. Um, they're getting business through referrals and that. Um, so, what other marketing have they done, if any? Are they just relying on the referrals, um, or have they you know, explored any other marketing avenues? And then I was also looking at um, their exit strategies and. Yeah, maybe getting caption on board and are the children um francis and peter are they is there any interest there in them taking over the business um mm. rather than looking at selling what what can be done in terms of continuity um, but, i mean this i'm sure raymond's got a, a bit of an insight into this but i suppose one of the things is when's the right time if you if 
if it is going to be a family business and your kids might want to get involved, when's the right time to do that? Because potentially they've already, you know, if they're a bit older, they've already got their own lives and careers. So, uh, yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Okay, great stuff. Thanks, Toby. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll make sure that the next time around we uh, give a bit more time for you to share your insight in terms of that marketing element. Um, so we'll get that done. Terry, talk to me about your thoughts. Um, so from, from my industry perspective, obviously, I'm going to um, ask them about employee benefits, how they're using those, how they could use those to encourage staff back in, like enhance uh, benefit scheme and employee assistance program will go a long way towards the duty of care for mental yeah. health, et cetera. Um, but from a, from a businessman point of view, the first thing that jumps out and the, the number one priority for me would be this, they've lost track of why they're not making money. Um, yeah, the, the outsourcing, everybody has to outsource at certain times. It's, yeah, it's valuable, but um, it's been mentioned before, like, should they now be looking at replacing the outsourcing with in-house staff? Is it a long-term yeah. thing or is it just a short-term? Is it a, is that extra turnover, turnover they want? Or have they just done it as a favour and should they now be looking to outsource it outside of the company? Um, I think their potential, well, one, they can't value the company if, they, if they're they're increasing turnover and lowering profits. They're, they're only going to devalue the company. Um, but two, they've got a reputational risk there. They, 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 you know, they've, had, they've obviously uh, very proud of what they've been doing, uh, but now there's, they're getting complaints in from the, the stuff sales source. So they need to get a hold of that. Like, yeah, immediately. get on top of that. Yeah. 100%. All right. Thanks, Terry. Really appreciate that, mate. Kevin, talk to me about your thoughts on... on yeah. I was looking at a slight different way to where we've all covered. I think this is a perfect example of a company and individuals being disorganised. Yeah. We're coming to a point where you should be seeking the advice of the mentor, advice of the accountant, IFA, life lending when it's appropriate. Three yeah. comes in three exceptions. One, you've got to look at the organisation yeah. business first. Uh-huh. And profit and loss. Secondly, their aim and their personal situation. And thirdly, for the mother in law, as uh, mother on that side, what's she really looking for? Because for them to consider lifetime mortgage is, in my view, a little bit too early by a number of years. David said, somebody of 82, she's a sound mind, etc., you would be able to lend <laughs> money there. And passing down through the generations would be better than them taking out first and foremost. The real thing it's a detailed old thing called fact find for three or four parties to be involved with, <laughs> then to pass it to the most appropriate people. Yeah, and you're right, you're right in terms of, of getting organized. I mean, typically when clients approach us, they're pretty well organized, but they just need some clarity in terms of whether they've whether they've got is enough but on occasion we do find people are not on top of where they are and again this is might be a discussion for the group sort of later on part of our job is to make sure we nudge action so that we do get organized because often it's not the easiest thing in the world to face some of these realities when you're when you're you know you should so how do you sort of encourage gently um the like to take an action in terms of some of this stuff so that that'll be a conversation we can certainly have paul con you talk to me about your thoughts and the actual questions you'd ask right well uh, always at the end here chris so everybody's already asked all the <laughs> You know what? We'll after David, we'll start with you on the next round, just to make sure that I don't make that mistake again. Sorry, mate. No. So uh, anyway, there you go. Um, obviously, I've got a slightly different focus to a lot of people here, but I think um, a number of comments have been made about sort of the planning for their later life. What comes over quite clearly here is they don't really know what to do, do they? They don't really have a, a vision for the future, so therefore they're thinking about. Should they step back? And some part of the case study, they say they definitely are, but actually that doesn't come through on the rest of the case study at all. So um, I think, you know, maybe it is a pandemic. Maybe everything has become very uncertain for them. Um, it's, it's difficult to really know what, they, what their life's going to look like. But I think, you know, be, before anything else, they need to really sit down and think about what they're, they're, they're planning to do. I mean, 
you know, obviously from my point of view, it could involve um, retirement or semi-retirement in in uh, in Spain or or whatever. And and uh, and then obviously, if that is what's on the agenda, the valuation of the business is quite key here, and um, <clears throat> there are a number of things that are uncertain there. They talk about the um, the existing uh, uh, employees taking over the the, the company. I'm not sure whether they're ready. Well, are they? You know, how would they finance that? I mean, how would they actually release the the, the money? Because it would seem, if these uh, people aren't independently wealthy or un, unable to get uh, business loans, then <clears throat> then really they they didn't have their money so tied up. They'll be taking a dividend in the uh, for for a while um, until perhaps the people uh, that take over the running of it are in a position to uh, 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 to actually buy. Uh, buy them out. I mean, we've 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 talked about this on in a circle before. It always seems to come up, come up probably because of the way I've the case study. <clears throat> but increasingly, employee ownership trusts become mm. potentially part of the mix. Now, you're right with the challenge with that. That's not a quick win. You know, that's not a sad and out if you sell it to employees. Effectively, it's a dividend for a fixed period of time, and you've got to wait potentially decades to re to release the capital you'd get from a, a commercial sale but um yeah it's a it's a challenge isn't it yeah so i think i think they've got a long way to go haven't they and i think they need to uh, perhaps wait until the pandemic is over they've got a bit more clarity obviously the valuation of the company becomes much easier once we've got a little bit more certainty as well um so that's really but so yeah i mean some of my biggest question is what do they actually want to do and uh, at what point do they think they will actually be able to, to make decisions based on on that yeah, you know what i mean it's an interesting one isn't it because do you i suppose, I suppose there's two elements that, that are running through my head number one do people put off making that decision because they assume it's definitive and it never is because you're what you always you know, you get through a stage, certainly with my clients, where, you know, they might change their mind as time goes on. Um, but also, number two, um, how can you do it without the clarity of numbers? You know, you just you just can't. So, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Certainly, I mean, obviously, uh, business valuations, they're great. You don't actually know whether you get what you're going to get until you put it on the market, do you? Yeah. <clears throat> At least it gives you some uh, some um, boundaries to, to think within. And uh, you know, and, you know, let's assume that they are interested in perhaps spending time abroad, whether it's in Spain or or, or elsewhere. Um, you know, what kind of uh, finances might they have available? What kind of uh, money will they need to maintain a home in the UK if they yeah. can do that? So, so let's say lots of uh, lots of questions there around their future, really. Amazing, great stuff. All right, well, I'll make sure that on the round robin we, we include you a little bit earlier so that so that people don't pinch your questions. Um, okay, so David, talk to me, uh, David Forsdyke, talk to me about the specific information you'd want and what opportunities do you think there might be for you to work with a client like this? Um, okay, I think in the first instance, um, I would want to know a bit more specifically about their current uh, main residence, um, what type of property do they own, what sort of value does it have, what sort of outstanding mortgage might they have against it. Um, the opportunity there is a very simple one. Um, here at Knight Frank Finance, we, we do a lot of mortgages, so <laughs> we might be able to help them, we might be able to improve the terms for them on the, the mortgage they've currently got. And, and I suppose, I mean, we know their ages, right? So if we yeah. take the Soraya and Martin and Shirley, in the later life lending space, what we're looking at in terms of the amount that they could potentially borrow from a percentage perspective, if they decide that's the route they want to take? Well, I think one of the one of the biggest opportunities in the, in the later life finance market is the fact that um, consumer choice has increased dramatically just in the last 12 months to be honest it's quite been quite revolutionary um so you know in terms of loan to value there are now retirement mortgages going up to 75 even 85 percent borrowing um if you look in the equity release space even at their age they'd probably be borrowing in around about 30 31 percent um at an absolute maximum 
Um, it gets rather expensive though at that level. They, they might want to look at much lower loan to value borrowing if they went down the equity release route. Personally, it looks far too early to me for them yeah. to even think about it. I mean, potentially they've got conventional borrowing options at that age anyway, yeah, haven't absolutely. they? So A lot of lenders are extending their, their age limits, pushing yeah. that sort of final deadline further and further away. So um, yeah, I think for, for me, that's the first opportunity. Can we help improve their personal situation around around the mortgage borrowing? And, and in um, terms of where your market sits at the minute, is it more people who are, because that's the other challenge we've got, you know, you've got Soraya who's 82, you know, looking at it from a more holistic inheritance tax planning perspective, um, she's got to give that money away. And if she gives that money, if she borrows and wants to get rid of it out of the estate, she's either got to spend it really quickly, um, <laughs> which um, might be a, you know, a bit more difficult, or give it away and then that starts a seven-year clock ticking. So um, so the challenge is that at that age, is it a good IHC planning tool? And I've, I, I think it's questionable. Well, at her, at her age, which is 82, um, you've really got to think very carefully about what her life expectancy looks like. Yeah. If, you're, if she's going to give that money away, then you need to have a, a degree of... Um, uh, Obviously, nobody can be certain, but you need a degree of um, uh, sort of a risk assessment over whether she is going to survive the seven years. So if she's in good health and looking after herself, uh, we would sit down with her financial advisor and, and others, perhaps bring Martin and Shirley into that conversation and just talk about, look, if, if she's worth more than, say, two million, and you need to take money out of that estate to reduce the inheritance tax liability for for Soraya, um, is she going to live long enough? And if they feel confident she is, then yes, you could use uh, a lifetime mortgage to do that. I think more importantly, though, is to look at her income position. Um, and this this actually reminded me of a client of mine. This is a great story. I had a, a client who lives in Kensington, just near Kensington High Street, uh, lives in a lovely apartment. Um, uh, she's a widow. Uh, her lifestyle was costing her about £40,000 a year. Her income was about £11,000 a year. So she was in this position where she'd run out of savings, simply. Um, in order to continue with her lifestyle, what we've done is we've set up a, a lifetime mortgage on a drawdown basis. And this is one of the great flexibilities that's, that's evolved within this market. We've given her a drawdown facility. She can draw money secured against her apartment in Kensington when she needs it. Um, what we've done though, and we were very careful to do this, is we've uh, made sure that her eldest daughter was involved in that conversation, that her eldest daughter has a lasting power of attorney in place for mum, um, and that the decisions about the amounts being drawn down Although we can't insist on it, we've encouraged her and to, her to discuss those those requirements as and when they come up. So, in other words, we don't want mum to get carried away and borrow huge amounts of money and just blow it down Kensington High Street. So, yeah. <laughs> well, if you're going to blow it somewhere, make it Kensington well, High Street. There, yeah. But. But I it think, just reminded me because she, this client, was 82 years old. So, right. Uh, yeah, but I think scenario. I think it's interesting because engaging other members of the family, I think you've got a professional duty of care to do. Um, so who else do we need to get involved, particularly when you're having really vulnerable potential client conversations to make sure that your client's okay. So yeah, it makes perfect yeah. sense. And vulnerability is a, is a big thing on the agenda for our uh, industry nowadays. So it is about just looking after these older uh, borrowers, making sure that they have got family and other professional people involved. I suppose, I suppose it's always that, and for me to probably have a sort of bit more of an insight into this, it's defining that line of capacity and vulnerability in terms of when's right, you know, um, and, and, and whether somebody's up for that conversation. Um, a very fortunate coincidence, the, um, the report that I mentioned earlier that my marketing team are pestering me about, um, the key topic that we're covering in this 
first report is around inheritance tax planning and how a lifetime mortgage can be used as a tool in that kind of planning. So um, I would love to share that with the group once it's cool. launched a bit later today. Yeah, cool, good stuff. We'll speak to Russ, David, once it's once you've uh, yeah. once you've got it, and we'll make sure it's shared, um, and then uh, we'll put it on LinkedIn as well. And I'm really sorry I can't stay any longer. But well, enjoy <laughs> enjoy your marketing meeting, mate. I, I only I only feel I only feel about ten percent of the Chris. I'm spinning, spinning <laughs> too many plates. The the fact that you acknowledged the eighties reference, so I'll, 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 you're forgiven. I love mate. that. That was so good. <laughs> So good. All well, right. not just not just eighties, but there is a more recent reference there. There well, is, which I there is very clever. <laughs> there is span generations. Yeah. All right, thanks, mate. Really Great appreciate it. See you that. all, and thanks good again. To, good to see you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, right, let's move on. Uh, Paul's not on my screen at the minute. I'll go back to Paul in a minute. Um, let's talk to Toby, who's going to talk to us about. Um, uh, a little bit about what he'd recommend, but more specifically, what they uh, what what they might do for mm. Martin and Shirley from that you know closing that marketing perspective. So uh, over to you, Toby. Yeah, I notice I've got. Um, I've already said. You know, do they need to um, suggest they need to start looking for a captain to run their ship? Um, you know, is that going to be somebody from the inside, somebody from the outside? Um, is it a family member? Um, I think they need to speak to uh, an HR expert, uh, Michael Newman of the world, mm -hmm. uh, about flexible working options. Uh, and also they need to speak to the employees. Somebody earlier said about your know, team spirit. Um, I think some of you know uh, Matt Barry, who during lockdown, he was sending, they've always got a thing about um, biscuits in their office. And during lockdown, he was getting biscuits delivered to them uh, each week. And it's just those sorts of things. So, you know, what's he actually doing about the, the team spirit? He needs to look at that. Um, obviously, speak to GDPR expert, but very much need to speak to a, a social media marketing expert. But I've got a note here. First, speak to me about getting those client avatars sorted in the value proposition sorted. And I, suppose, I suppose this is the thing, isn't it? It's been clear on what, who their ideal client is Absolutely, and, yeah. and, and, and what they look like. Um, Otherwise, like I said in the past, you're, you're standing in the street with a loud hailer. Um, yeah. Buy my product, buy my service. I, 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 it's really interesting. So some of you know that, um, uh, and Terry was there, we had this conversation Friday, didn't we, funny enough, Terry, about marketing on, uh, I run a sort of local business group called Haver Means Business. And part of the that conversation is... You know, each sector's got their own way of um, of, of, of marketing their, their business, um, but not wasting money on places where we don't think, you know, that, that particular marketing route's going to work. But part of the challenge that, you know, the dialogue in the group, we had the florist in the group who said, you know, direct Google My Business stuff really works. Uh, I, I would say that all of our stuff comes from referrals and professional relationships so it's you know how do you identify that correct route for you help me understand a little bit more about that so was that addressed to me i thought that was to terry yeah. toby say again so how would you how would you effectively so it starts with a client avatar but then how do you then make sure that from the marketing perspective, you're, yeah. you're sort of hanging out in the right places? So, so it's all about understanding those client avatars, understanding their, their needs, their wants, their desires, their pains. And from really looking at those client avatars carefully, that brings forward the emotive words that you're then going to be using in your marketing. Um, whether that's networking, whether it's social media, whether it's pay-per-click, whether it's on your website, those words are formed from your careful study of your client avatars, yeah. of what they're, um, what really drives them, because you know, people buy an emotion. So yeah. what is it that, um, that triggers them emotionally? You then use those words in your, um, as an example, my, my tagline is helping business owners become wealthy faster. It, it tags the two most important things to business owners, wealth and time. So yeah. just using those things that are really important to people in your in your marketing. Yeah. 
Great stuff. Lovely. Thanks for that. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, I think a lot of the challenges that the uh, Mike and Jenny face are based around um, teams, staff, and knowing what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. So, Alex, talk to me about the sort of guardrails that you'd put on Martin and Shirley, because I think Martin's keen to turn around and go, right, I want everybody back in the office, but clearly you can't do that. So talk to me about the, you know, what's allowable in terms of, of those rails and, and what he could potentially do to um, help uh, encourage his staff back in. Okay, so obviously we've got the, I think, uh, so Mark said we've got sort of the COVID guidelines at the moment, where obviously, the guidelines are very much, um, or regulations very much, uh, work from home where possible. Um, and it's really up to individual businesses to work out whether actually they, those staff can work from home permanently until the regulations change or whether actually there is a desire to bring those individuals back in. But you may find that bringing those back, individuals back in, they may well have concerns about their return mm. in terms of their own health, uh, etc. And uh, where an employee raises their concerns about their working environment, uh, they shouldn't be put at a detriment as a result of that, opens up uh, a claim, uh, etc. So first of all, they need to work out, uh, can the status quo continue? They've been working from home for the last six months or the last year. Um, should be no reason why they can't do so the next uh, six months. But all of a sudden, if productivity drops or there's been issues then they may need to encourage staff back in or simply turn around and say we require you to come back in from the 1st of May maybe on a phased return one day a week two days a week and three days a week um and I think it's making sure that um staff know kind of what is required in terms of sort of social distancing and making sure that um all of the staff concerns are addressed appropriately sort of a consultation at least a discussion to make sure that a lot of these staff are on board with the process it's a dialogue, rather than saying yeah. for example that's it returning tomorrow full stop yeah. notice but some maybes um let's say it's that um that dialogue because at the end of the day your staff will be waiting at it you don't have your staff you have no yeah. business yeah yeah i yeah, appreciate that and i suppose the other the other factor that in the case study is that element where um uh, you've got some of the staff who are more than capable of working from home and it works. Mm -hmm. But the, a lot of conversations I've had with both clients, professional connections and other business owners I know um, is all around the, some of my staff, it's like they, they can't work from home because they haven't got the right mm -hmm. environment. Um, so how, did, how, did, how does a business owner and employer manage that? I think I say simply put, uh, if they can't work from home, they should be coming back into the office. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's making sure, like I say, that uh, that workplace is COVID secure. And like I say, if there are particular people who have been shielding, for example, then there's obviously sort of separate conversations to be had. But I say simply, if one is a receptionist, for example, you may not be able to carry out your receptionist role at home. And so it's perfectly reasonable, in my view, for an employer to say, we need to be back in the office. Gotcha. Yeah. And it, so it depends on role, depends on the, the employee situation. Um, mm -hmm. But I think you're right. I think that engagement right. with employees is going to be key, isn't it? It is. And like I say, it's, um, it's a process, isn't it, that one sort of goes through rather than um, sort of some employers um, don't take that sort of dialogue seriously and it's very much say back to work tomorrow and end of it's not going to work is it no in your in your experience yeah mm -hmm. in terms of in terms of currently a lot of the employment uh law cases you're on covid related or are they sort of more sort of traditional with have we not seen the sort of start of the of, of COVID employment law situation yet? Or We're starting to see a few more now. I think there's a, a massive uh, rush when we're sort of furloughing people. Why aren't, why aren't I furloughed compared to my colleague X, for example, is it because my race, my sex, religion, sexual orientation, for example. Yeah. And that sort of, sort of slowed down slightly. Then you had that uh, sort of large scale sort of redundancies in sort of September, October, where sort of furlough was, or had to be ending. Um, 
and I said a lot of there are a lot of redundancies, reorganizations, uh, etc. There's a few areas in terms of like say some furlough disputes, etc. Or I've got concerns about my return. But it's not yeah. something we necessarily get our teeth into at an early stage very much. Okay, set out your concerns to your employer. Your employer can then uh, address those concerns. That's again going back to that dialogue. Other as you say, the other challenge is, you know, decisions made during furlough and decisions made to make people redundant over the next year. Why have you made those choices, right? That's that's an issue, yeah. potentially. Yeah, very much yeah, so. Cool. Great say. stuff. Thank you. Yeah, really appreciate that. Janet, so you're, you're sitting in front of Martin and Shirley. Um, you're sort of trying to help them make some decisions about the next stage in their life from the business's perspective. What are you recommending they do? Okay, so I think, you know, once we've got their numbers, um, I think we'll be looking at, okay, do you, if we're going to continue with the business as it is, you know, what do you want to do to, um, you know, to maximise some profits out of this rather than, you know, maximising revenues? Maybe there's some customers that you no longer need to deal with that are actually not generating the sufficient uh, profits yeah. for you so i think that you know once we've got the numbers we could have them conversations about that i think the other thing that um i'd be wanting to look at is that you know if we're going to work towards um selling this business we want to get the balance sheet in the most healthiest position we can i mean that i mean i i don't so value the business but i do know that that would be a critical point um, for the valuation and it can take you know maybe three years to work towards getting that healthy position to be in so I'd be looking at you know individual areas within that to improve you know maybe we need to reduce um, debtors you know to, to get that in a better position maybe we need to um, you know look at the borrowing that's going on and, and address that director's loan accounts you know what what situation are they in so I think it, you know that the earlier you can address all them things, the better valuation they're going to get. And, and if that's what they're working towards, then, you know, that's what I'd want to work with them um, on that. And what we're we looking at in terms of time scale for that preparation. So what would you recommend that? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the people I talk to who, who, you know, do that for a living, they value businesses, um, they would say to me three years, get, you know, it would take three years to get your company in the best position it can. So, you know, ultimately, you can you can value it straight away, but, you know, we, that won't necessarily give you the best, um, the best sort of uh, return on it. That you can but, um, I think it was a very interesting point what um, Pradeep made, though, about, because I, I, I see sort of two different... Um, it's types of businesses generally and those that are very um very emotive you know it doesn't matter what numbers you present to them such an emotional decision being made um but there are those that actually form their business with the view to selling it and that's a totally different um approach then because they're you know it is a much more commercial um type of arrangement but yes it was an interesting point yeah you know you know what's really interesting though uh, I mean, I had, a, I had a call with a new client this morning um, who uh, I think is going to engage. We've sent it all the terms and we're, we're, just, we're just waiting for him to come back. And this new client is um, in his uh, late 60s with no intention of stopping work ever um, because he loves it. Yeah. Now, he might, I mean, I, I always say to clients, you know, base it on a stage that one day you might not. Um, so that you've at least then got the choice of stopping and thankfully he's in a position where if he wanted to stop he could um, but we I, I don't know whether we still assume of that like we assume everybody's in that industrial aid perspective where they work 40 years and then stop my experience is that we yeah. don't want to do that anymore no. so no. So there's the element of that, am I defined by my business? But there's yeah. also that element of what do I do after my business? And does work include definitely. part of that? Yeah, I don't know. definitely. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a it, very interesting point. But yeah, I mean, I literally have got a client who's again, also in his uh, six, six, mid-60s um, and just literally I've got no intention of stopping to work. He loves what he does. He's you know been formed his business you know 40 years plus ago and um he, you know he loves it he's like what else would i do Fair point. but, yeah. but this, this is the thing and, and, and again the guy the, the business coach guys will have uh, an impact on that yeah. i i i always build a personal financial plan based on um be be at a point where work is optional 
yeah. even if you choose to carry on, right? That's the yeah. point we want to get to most, most people on. And I suppose the business club would be build a business to sell, even if you never sell it, yeah. right? Yeah. So I, I think yeah. those goals and aspirations as, a, as an end game don't mean that you've got to stop. Got to it. Yeah. Um, it just means that you can choose to if you want choice. to. And it, yeah. It's a bad choice of time, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so it's good. good. Yeah, really, 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 really fair point. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, so Paul's not left at the end again, Paul Conyu. I just don't, I don't want to leave you yeah. out, mate, and, and, and everybody nick your, uh, nick your best ideas. So you're sitting down with Martin, Shirley and Soraya. What are you saying specifically about how you'd uh, how you potentially support them well I mean, either sorry one point either from your own personal experience with your background but also from your business perspective yeah i, I think that it really comes back to what i said before i think that they're a bit of crossroads aren't they and uh, and I, if i was sitting down with them i'd want to sit down with someone like Pradeep as well where uh, uh, it's part of planning. I think uh, planning for the future. I, I think um, clearly the, pan the pandemic has, has, has impacted them. Um, I think you know, the point you made about you know, preparing it for sale, and, and then you don't, you know, you can make the choice whether you do or not. It, it is a good one, but I think there's a motivation, or well, there could well be a motivation issue here in that. You know, how do they? Um, spend the time to make the changes that they're going to need to make it saleable um, for the best best value if they are uncertain about what their future life might look like so I mean I, I really think that is that is key to, to, to the, 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 these people um, and the turnover the, the valuation the structure of the business I mean it does seem that um, they've been doing okay I mean they're, they're doing outsourcing you know should they bring that in-house i think the one thing that they do need to do because if they've got a question about uh, uh, over the people that they've currently got um you know that the, they the report to them as whether they are able to take the business further forward and i think they need to look at the the training um aspects there so i'd be talking to them about what skills they think the business will need in their in their absence um both um, obviously, they wouldn't want to see the business collapse. But also, the, the, um, if people want, if, if they wanted to sell the business off um, as an investment rather than for people who wanted to take, come in and take it over, then uh, clearly having a business with um, with the right skills on board is going to be quite important for, for that process. So, so yeah, my recommendation is that they should sit down and they should do some scenario planning about what their retirement might look like. Um, uh, what selling the business might mean to them what's important to them um and and at the same time obviously they do have a business to uh, to make sure uh, continues um they should be um uh, to be bringing in some uh, business consultants i think to to help them see what the next stage is for for them yeah. so yeah as someone else mentioned uh, they need to uh, bring in advice i think that's that's certainly the case they need they need to talk to a number of people from different angles but Priority for me would be to do their uh, late, later life planning to give them an idea of what kind of scenarios they would have. And you know, if they, if um, I, mean, I, I said earlier on, I, I help people buy and sell. I mean, they may, maybe they've got a property overseas that they would like to um, um, to sell so that they can add that to their pot, um, so they can do what they they want to elsewhere. So you know, that would be the next stage. For me that i'll then join the conversation and talk about what kind of options they realistically have um but this is the important thing isn't it paul i mean it's not about you know you know for me and certainly I think we'll, we'll come on to Friday next to talk about this it's what, what are you going to spend your time doing you know it's not the money it's the time first and how does your life look i mean one question we ask is what does an ideal day, week, month, year look like after we're finished? Um, and that 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 then sort of gives us a, a bit of an insight. Thank, thanks, Paul. I appreciate that. Friday, share with me, you know, I, I think Paul's absolutely right in terms of um, having a chat with somebody like you, because that is a big jump from that, you know, where we are now to where we want to get. How do you guide people over that process? Um, certainly a lot of the uh, questions asked by a lot of the squares and panel here 
are very relevant. But I think what we need to do here is when I, the process I use is guiding through every aspect of their life. A business is one of them. Uh, and it's been a key part of it for maintaining a lifestyle. With a lifestyle, you would have had a certain health and well-being condition. With a lifestyle would have gone your social interaction, which Martin proved that he's missing already. Uh, with the business would have been your family, uh, your immediate, uh, I mean, Martin and Shirley, their relationship, extended relationship. Uh, with the business would have given them a lifestyle of leisure, things that they would have been able to afford. Uh, so a lot relies on the business. Now we've looked at the business that is not profitable at the moment. It's been drained because more and more they're outsourcing because the key from the text here, a lot of the business is through outsourcing and it's already creating problems because they're not doing to the same standard as Martin would have delivered. So that is a drain on the resources. So question here is, um, it's like um, uh, Toby said, when you're running a business, you create a client avatar. In my business, what I do is I create your own avatar. What do you want to be looking like? Well, you know, it's like, um, uh, uh, well, Paul mentioned, uh, you know, it's not straightforward to say what would you like to live or what your life's going to be like in the next five years or so. We don't know at this stage. We don't know what the health is going to be like. We don't know what uh, mm -hmm. mental state is going to be like. We don't know what our relationship is going to be like. So what we do start with is an aspiration. And just like you do business planning, you put certain elements in together and then work toward it. Like in any business, you have to have a focus to reach the goals. You know, you have a budget, you have a business plan and it's focus and it's all step by step. So you build in in eventualities. If something crops up, you are ready to uh, address it. Likewise in life, Things will happen. You don't know what's around the corner. It could be a health issue. It could be a relationship breakdown or even the business goes under. So you, we address each of these of eventuality. But first is you start with where you are here and now today. What are your key strengths? What have you built so far in terms of resources? Not just the business resources, financial resources, but your health and your relationship. Because when you move out of a business, you'll, relation, you'll lose relationship from your clients your suppliers so the the idea of that your own avatar what you'd ideally like to look like in five ten years is an interesting one what component parts would you include in that conversation a lot of the elements i mentioned here yeah. uh your health and well-being is key because yeah. if that's under compromise everything else <clears throat> goes on the back burner uh your financial well-being and this is where you come in to help uh, say you know, these are my aspirations i want to spend money on x y and z uh including where we've got um terry healthcare what are we going to be doing when the health is uh, compromised so you have that in place mentally as well as financially well, what does lifestyle look like with that helps absolutely right. how are we going to manage you know the aging process is inevitable for everybody around here yeah. How do you manage when your aging process takes place? I mean, for a lot of us, it's taking place already. You know, the hair's moving off there down here. <laughs> yeah. It's funny, I had a meeting this morning. We were talking about hairs moving into the ears and onto the chest and area. <laughs> so it's, it's in reverse. But, you know, eventually, I mean, I, I work with people. Yeah, who, I am. Um, I, I... I work with people who've got family issues. Sorry, go on, brother. If it's not their own health, it's the family members. So if you take Martin and Shirley, at the moment they have a partnership of a certain nature, a, a relationship. If the health is compromised on one of them, one becomes a carer, the other becomes cared for. So the relationship changes. So likewise, as, a, as the aging process takes place, you've got the rise of dementia at the moment. Through the COVID period, you've got a, a increase in mental health challenges even for the best of people who are resilient. So it's addressing all these. And when do, something like that does happen, where do you seek support in the system? So it's forward thinking a little bit and building it around your avatar. The avatar is not something to scare you. It's supposed to be inspirational, aspirational, something that you're yeah. excited to achieve. So really, should, I mean, it should be an exciting, <laughs> it should be an exciting conversation, shouldn't it, really? Oh, you know, absolutely. It should be a conversation yeah. about think like being optimistic and positive about what the next stage looks like 
Um, <laughs> and I know that I'm guilty of uh, possibly being a bit over optimistic at times, but um, uh, that 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 certainly should be an enthusiastic conversation. Thanks, Pradi. Really appreciate that. Thank Terry, you. I mean, it's it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I think health particularly as you get older, certainly plays a part in, in part of that conversation. <laughs> How many clients do you see that are looking at saying, look, this is an asset that I want to make sure that if I do need care, I get it more immediately and, and having that dialogue with you? Yeah, absolutely. It's certainly the, the older ones. And one of the things we, we offer is a, is a, a multi-generational policy. So you know, looking here at them with their, their older mother, uh, and their grandchildren. So, yeah, what more is what, what gives you more um, like joy or, or, or pride than you, you're looking after your family and yeah. the peace of mind that your your parent is going to get access to the right <laughs> care at the right time. Um, so that's yeah, that's one of the things we often talk about. And it's yeah, it's one of the when you you're asking about specific inf information, it's like what the Martin, Martin and Shirley have now currently. If they're in a company scheme, then now's the time to look at exiting into a family scheme, because you'll know, Chris. Like when you're trying to transfer from a, one private medical insurance company to another, that can become pretty difficult. Like even within companies, because you go from a company scheme to a private scheme, it's yeah, still the underwriting is different, different, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, and I'm talking to my my 60 plus um, clients and saying, okay, <clears throat> you've got a company scheme, everything's running nicely, but how long do you intend to stay in a company? Yeah, you know, are you going to be selling the company? Why not look now about running a little family scheme? But then, but then this is part of the challenge, isn't it, Terry? It's the same one Janet's talk, talking about, and probably we'll have a conversation with Paul and Raymond in a minute about their perspective on it. It's you know having that strategic, longer term thinking, yeah. and getting these component parts in place early enough. So that you're not going, oh, I've got to get this done, yeah. and by then it's too late. One guy I was talking to last week, he's, he's does a, uh, office interiors, so obviously he's struggling at the moment. I'm like, okay, now's the time, switch it into a family scheme. He's like, I'm going to be doing this job until I'm 75. He's only like 60. Like, I don't want to switch out of a company scheme. I'm like, I'm going to save you money. I'm going to give you longevity. I'm going to give you peace of mind. You don't want to be dealing with this stuff later in life. You want you want to set the foundations now. Yeah, so that you know. Yeah, yeah. No, 100%. Yeah, no, I complete, completely agree. So who should I go? I mean, Paul's off mute. So Paul Valston's off mute. So we'll go to Paul first and then we'll, then we'll call for Laura Raymond. Okay. Um, a bit of an arbitrary way of picking who's next, Paul, but I'm, I'm going with it. <laughs> Thank um, you. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, so talk, talk to me a little bit about, you know, you've got this couple. Yep. They're clearly unsure of where they sit today. Yep. Um, uh, how do you get them to a point where they've got clarity? I think, um, yeah, uh, just before you, uh, I answered that, there's something I saw on LinkedIn this morning, actually, I don't know, which is a post from a guy uh, who obviously spent the weekend in hospital. He had a mask, he did all the A&E stuff behind him. And he said, I hadn't, ex I hadn't um, expected to be spending the weekend like this, but I was. I was rushed into hospital. Um, you know, he's, he's in his early 50s. Um, he was head of compliance for HSBC. And he said, I made a list of the 10 things I would do. Number one, I work a lot less harder. Number two, I won't accept any uh, any more pressure from my employer. It wasn't his own business. But our whole list spent more time. Than so I think sometimes you need a health crisis or some people do before they actually realize just as everyone's just been saying how much your health is important so i just sort of throw that in because it, yeah. we just don't know anything can happen i mean yeah, yeah it's that reality check isn't it absolutely I mean, Oof, you know, wow. I mean we've seen it in the last year i mean it's yeah. been sort of a lot of people really reevaluate where they mm. are because absolutely. of unfortunate yeah. circumstances it's yeah. tough no, I think that's absolutely. But I think what I would suggest actually is is almost yeah a meeting with probably something like yourself or a product whatever to actually to look at both sides at the same time. I, I often run these workshops where we say, well, okay, what are the per, what are the financial goals? Where do you want to be to? So you want five million in three years time? Well, how feasible is that, Chris? <laughs> you say, well, etc. Um, so whatever you come down to and say, well, what do you need to live the lifestyle you want? And in that process, you do ask them, what do they want to do? And sometimes leisure is not 
necessarily their first choice, strange no. enough, because if, if, if as uh, Janet Jan said earlier, some people just want to work until they drop. Um, and I think often the reason for that is they feel intellectually they won't be stimulated by just sitting on a beach or whatever. And, and the irony is, in a way, they haven't experienced what could be very, very um, stimulating in their uh, retirement years it could be a particular type of hobby it could be I don't know voluntary work um, lots and lots of things there are a whole host of things I mean I've got a laundry list of things I'm going to do when I go on holiday my son said what are you going to do when you stop where I said don't worry I won't have any trouble but, you know, yeah. just lots of things to do and, and it's often if you don't know about these things you don't know what's out there so that's number one I think so once you decide where do they want to go well I, you say okay well what's feasible so how big is the business in this as you say it's, it is an asset um, as we talked they've got their home and their mother's situation and then what do we need to do over the next three years or over two years to actually achieve that situation and look at every it's like a mosaic in a way looking at the business you know if they're not going to be in it um is there somebody in the business who could take it on um maybe with an employee ownership thing or maybe with some sort of mba backed by outside capital um what are the other things sales and marketing has all been talked about um and when you sell a business too you need to show an uh, an acquirer that there's you've got a very well-run company and obviously it's financially but also that you need good governance people think oh well, we don't need a board of directors it's just us actually you, you do because it shows an acquirer that actually you're serious about business you you've got a business plan uh, you're sticking to it and you have you know, the governance every month to make sure you're on track and that's another option for them they may want to stay as non-execs for example later down the line small shareholding um, they could dial in for board meetings from wherever new zealand or wherever their holiday home is uh, and so they retain their links like that and i think once you've done that then you have a, an action plan and you decide how you're going to make it happen um and actually just some of the clues in there as to what uh, their business actually it is really an interesting area at the moment cyber security is massive at the moment um so there's Depend, you know, there's a lot of big companies on cyber, but they could go for their own niche. Um, if we get more digital, there's more risk. So there's a big area there. And as I said earlier, helping small companies become digital. So I think it, it is a bit of a stage thing, but you do it in partnership with the financial hat on. Also, maybe a life planner as well to maybe get them to think about yeah. where they want to go. Um, I mean, I mean, I mean, the point the point you raise is interesting. We find that you know. With a lot of our clients who've taken the next step, some some of them do it really smoothly and go like, "I know what I'm up yeah, to; it's yeah. fine." The yeah. two gaps that people struggle with, with the most yeah. are um, uh, purpose. Yes, interesting. P purpose yeah. is yeah. the big yeah. one. Yeah. You know, what, yeah. How do I define myself in this next stage yeah. of my life? Yeah. Yeah. But again, the intellectual st stimulation element. You know, yes. what yeah. what yeah. what yeah. challenges do I need in my life to make yeah. sure that I'm yeah. moving forward? Yeah. It's an interesting one. And often, um, just on that, I, I spoke to a lady uh, not so long ago who was looking to sell her business potentially, and she's a solicitor and quite successful in three or four branches. And I said to her, I said, well, look, um, OK, let's say, you know, I was able to give you what, what would be your figure? You know, two million, three million. Her husband is more or less. I said, well, I, I, I could manage on a million. I said, well, what would you do? And she said, well, I'd start another business. I said, what do you mean? I said, what sort of business? I said, You're, oh, yes, I start a cattery. And I said, what? And she said, that's been my dream. So Passion, yeah. It's, it's amazing. I mean, it's bizarre, isn't it? So that would be a, like a hobby. And so it's all sorts of, until you ask the question, you never know, do you? Yeah, on a, on a personal note, I'll never be out, opening a category. I no, went no, to, uh, <laughs> I, I went to, it was funny, uh, uh, Facebook always reminds me of what I was up to. And when we could do that travelling thing, oh, yeah. um, I was in, two years ago, I was in Japan in oh, a nice. cat cafe, yeah. One of the weirdest experiences <laughs> I've ever had. That's bizarre. I don't. I know. I know. Charlotte wanted to go, probably. So I was like, when, when your kids say, "Should we experience it?" Yeah, oh, yeah we'll give it a oh, go. God. Um, but I tried to stroke one, and it gave me the dirtiest look I've oh, ever really? seen. Oh, really? So, so yeah, I won't be over, opening a cat. I'm, I'm more of a dog bloke. Absolutely. There you go. Um, anyway, thanks for that, Raymond. Talk to me about your thoughts around this particular client. Well, um, so get the easy one out of the way, because I agree with you need to have a, 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 a personal plan first, because the business needs to come to you and you need to decide what you're doing with the business based on what you actually want out of this. 
and what and how much you actually need. Uh, one of the things I would say is that there are different ways to depend on how quickly they need to sell. There are different ways to approach the business and what you do within the business to try to deliver the right kind of number. Um, one of the things I've put here is um, whilst I as a finance director, whilst I appreciate the numbers, I'm less interested. This sounds probably a bit back to front what the final number is. I'm more interested in the building blocks and the decision making. So it's one thing to identify that there's loss making clients. It's another thing to take it all the way back to the beginning when they make decisions about clients, that they pick the right new business based on key KPIs of what profitability they're looking for. Uh, one thing I would say if you want to sell a business it's been my experience that you don't build to the number that you want. You build it to the number that the market actually wants because your client, the, your person who buys it will want um, growth in the business when they buy it. So yeah. if they need five million quid, build it so that the person who's buying it can get more than five million pounds out of it without trying. So yeah. that's, yeah, they don't want to be working hard when they buy it. They want to know that they can underwrite a number when they buy it. As, as an interesting point, and it, it alludes to the fact that we're not building to we're building to a to sell, but we're not building to end, are we? It's it's got to be a continued commercial entity that effectively works for any purchaser. Yeah, and if you and what I saw, because I have a pro professional services background, what I saw over the last, especially the last ten years, is for example, private equity seriously, seriously overpaying for businesses that were already capped out of what they could deliver. Yeah. So they were mm. buying for value that was cut, that was due to come, that was never in the business. So, and uh, so you've got to be really conscious. If you, if you build for a business that can go beyond where you want, where your exit number is, you will get the, you will get the return for the, for the future profits, not for the profits where you are. So, yeah, I think it's important that you actually understand the mechanics and the building blocks of the, of the business to actually be able to deliver. Cause when I talk to clients, if you want ex if you want more return, then your business will need to deliver more return, and therefore you need to understand where your business is delivering return to get what you want, rather yeah. than uh, to make sure it goes that way. Well, so, yeah, look, all of our businesses is, is to serve, don't they? At the end of the day, I mean that's that's the reality. So, how do you add more value? And that way, and the way you add more value is build more asset in your business. And that's yeah. not about writing client business. It's about creating, um, whether it be new products, whether it be new markets for your products, it, that's where you'll create value, not yeah. selling the same things over and over again. Yeah, good point. Really good point. Thanks, Ryan. Really appreciate that. Um, for me, to talk to me about I'm, what I'm interested in is Soraya. So talk to me a little bit about... Um, uh, how, if it's, if we're in a position where capacity is not a cut and dry black and white thing, how legal professionals and the, and, 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 and the people who need to make these decisions make a judgment on capacity? Okay, so basically um, we need to check obviously whether she does have an LPA in place. Um, also, we need to obtain an assessment from a medical expert to confirm whether she does actually have capacity or not. Um, she may have a social worker in place. That's something because of due to her age, more than likely she probably does. Um, need to find out whether she um, has carers, whether she requires care. Um, also whether she is having basically receives any assistance from anyone. So basically for shopping, et cetera. Um, also, um, whether she's basically paying for care, the value of the property, what other assets she has, whether there is, whether everything is tied up or whether she has any savings. Um, so there's a number of things that need to find out in relation to obviously her, her basically her assets and also her mental capacity before we can obviously move forward in basically making a, um, an application. And then if she doesn't have capacity, we need to find out who will want to be appointed uh, as a deputy to act for her. So if obviously Martin and what's the other lady called? Shirley. Shirley, if they are not able to act for her, then it's potentially going to be a panel deputy or a partner in a firm. Or did, 
Sorry. Sorry, the question I was going to ask is, do, do courts prefer the, de uh, the attorney to be a family member? Or would they automatically appoint a deputy of, of the court? So, no. So what would happen is if, um, let's just say, uh, Martin contacted us and stated that the, um, the mother doesn't have capacity and needs some um, legal advice, um, basically I would go through the assessment and find out whether she does actually have capacity or not because we'll need to obtain an assessment from a medical expert. And then he could be appointed as the deputy. Now, the court will obviously make the final decision whether he's bankrupt or not that would play a big part or whether he's been refused any loan. So the court has tendency to appoint family members if we make the application on their behalf. However, if no one has been appointed and the social worker has contacted the, um, is they call the Office of the Public Guardian, that's another organization. Yeah. And what they would do is uh, re refer it to, well, the Office of the Public Guardian would refer it to the court section and then they will refer it to a panel deputy. So that's a different course altogether. Yeah, as you know, I've got a, I've got an exam on trust next week. So this is all good stuff for me. To, thank you very much for uh, reminding me what I need to what I need to know. Um, I suppose I suppose the other interesting thing is time scales, isn't it? You know, it is the POA route, power of attorney route, a better route for most people, purely and simply because of the time it takes to 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 get a. a uh, to get a deputy appoint, uh, attorney appointed in, in the other route. Talk, talk to me a little bit about yeah. those timescales. So basically with the power of attorney, it, the, the turnaround is quite quick. And also the fact that you can you choose who you appoint and the cost is a lot less as well. But for court protection side, it is more expensive. And I mean, if it's an emergency application, then it effectively can be similar to an LPA the length of time. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the cases that I do receive is to do with L basically attorney disputes. So we're revoking LPAs. So there's there's that aspect as well. So and why why would somebody revoke an LPA? So basically, where the attorney has um, not acted in the best interest of the um, donor, yeah. um, the person who lacks capacity, or they've basically misappropriated funds and so forth. And has that, has that come to light? When, when do you... Well, what happens is, let's just... Usually is where the care needs to be paid and the care fees are not being paid and gotcha. just stack it up. And then basically what they will do is refer it to the OPG and state that this is, you know, the attorney's not making any payments. Ah, they will right. investigate and then find other family members, contact them and say, well, what is actually happening? They'll refer it to a panel deputy or the family members will contact us and we'll go from there. Great. So it's normally in, in, with bills not being paid and then that sort of raising the yeah. red flag. All right. Interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Or there's other aspects <laughs> where there's basically, um, let's say, um, siblings arguing, disputing. One sibling has been appointed and the other one hasn't. And the one that's been appointed is basically not making any payments and not in the best interest of um, P or where they've sold P's property and put them in a care home when they could remain at the property and they've basically taken the sale proceeds. So gotcha. that's, that's kind of an issue. So. You're, you're bursting my optimistic babble, bu bu babble for me, do you know that? But I know this stuff goes on and uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's good that there's people out there fighting on these individuals' behalf. Michael, talk to me about um, uh, the where we sit from a HR perspective around, you know, not only incentives, you know, because we've got the hard employment law HR stuff, but we've also got the, you know, the side where we can potentially say let's encourage and incentivize people to, to, to act in a certain way. Where, where would you sort of, where would you sit in terms of helping Martin and Shirley navigate what they want for their business, but also what they want for their employees? Well, I think they need to know, well, well, let's go back to the beginning. Uh, well, Alex has already said they need to have contracts and handbooks and all that stuff in place. On top of that, they would need to have some kind of appraisal system in place where they evaluate each employee every year as objectively as possible. And the way people are doing it now is they're really doing it not so much formally, 
but they're doing it more with the peer-to-peer -peer review and basically means getting other employees to evaluate each other. Now, you've got to be careful with that because if you don't, you know, somebody doesn't like somebody, it gets difficult. But they need to establish some kind of training program and progression program for each employee so that they can put together some milestones which will address their skill set within the business. But also, I'll go back to what I said before, they do need to get some somebody in there to help them with their mental health because that if they're all working remotely some people like it as we said and some people don't like it they need to be able to address that and make sure that people understand what they can and what they can't do they also need to put in some kind of buddy system where senior employees within not them but one level down monitor and take care of the people below them and also put in a proper onboarding system for anybody new that does come in yeah. and obviously have good statistics on absenteeism I and mean, people are absent because of genuine reasons fine but if there's regular patterns of people are off every monday or every friday or i've got some underlying conditions to really understand what motivates or demotivates their employees and to try and work with them to address those situations yeah it's that development isn't it yeah, you know, developing them and, yeah, and then, no, yeah no, i want to go to a particular course whether it's job related or whether it's just lifestyle related to encourage them to get into that kind of stuff yeah i, sp I suppose the other element is is i mean i'm not convinced these couple have got a handle on whether they're being productive at home or not because they might not have an handle on what their profit and, well, and uh, other assets are but how would you measure that productivity well what i wouldn't do is invest in one of these wretched systems that measures out how many keystrokes and how many times you get up and go to the <laughs> toilet because that in my opinion, sends the wrong message. But people yeah. do it. Companies do it. Some of the banks have done it, especially in America. And you that, know what the challenge I've got with that is, is what does it say about trust of, and exactly. culture of your organisation? Exactly. So if you do, if, no, if you decide you're going to take a couple of hours out during the day, but start working to 10 o'clock at night to still do the job, what the heck? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And, 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 and in your experience, what, you know, working with your clients and what you've seen, what, what, how have employers managed mental health in a good way in the last year and how have they managed it badly? Most of my clients are too small to worry about whether they've got to manage it good, well or badly. But some of the bigger ones have gone in for those learning and development programs I've just been talking about, looking at supply, you know, looking at employees as a whole and trying to work with them to maximize whatever skills they've got. Some others, because they've got other underlying issues like cash flow or furlough or whatever, have tended to ignore people. It's been a lot of, yeah, yeah, a lot of that, yeah. Uh, and to build on something that Alex said before, the health and safety issues can be a major, 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 major concern for employers because there's something called Section 44 of the Employment Rights Act and Section 100, which basically says if an employee comes in and doesn't like it, it's not convinced he's in a safe environment and he goes home. If the employer sacks him, it's an automatically unfair dismissal and he ends up at a tribunal, and, which means the employer has got to be exceptionally careful how he, for want of a better word, sells to the employer, employee, sorry, how safe and secure the place is and what he has done to make sure it's safe. And it goes back to that point. I think it's right, that's a continuous process. Yeah, it might be safe yeah. in April, the 19th, but by April 22nd, something it might happen. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to that point. It's the relationship and the yeah. dialogue, not just say you're in. And, yes. and, and yeah. And that applies to vaccinations and testings as well, really, because you can't, as Alex has also said, you cannot compel people. You might get away with it in a care home, but you probably won't. Yeah, because I remember that we've spoke about this before. There's an element of saying if there's a health risk, there might be a level of compulsion. Yeah, but, but again, it's not been tested yet. As, as I'm, it, I'm copying Alex's lines, there's not been that many cases yet to look at this yeah. stuff. Yeah. There's only one man who went to Tate and Lyle in uh, Silvertown, refused to wear a mask, and he did get fired and he lost. So, because uh, whoever it was, the company that was delivering to Tate and Lyle insisted that people wore masks. Tate and Lyle insisted that people wore masks on site. He refused for some bizarre reason. 
uh, the company couldn't find another job for him, so they sacked him, and they got away with it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I but suppose... Like, one I know of. No, do you know of any more, Alex? No, I think that's probably the, the only one that I've heard of, certainly um, in the last sort of couple of couple of months. Um, but but then but then it's going to re- evolve over time, isn't it? You know, absolutely. we're going to see case law come out essentially years in it, like sort of, you know, as it goes through the courts. So yeah, it yeah, will it'd be interesting to see. And there'll be a mountain, as Alex has also said, of furlough-related cases, especially as furlough comes to an end. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's interesting. I've had this conversation with a, a few people. You know, it, it'd be interesting to see whether how much of furlough was a sticking plaster on a longer-term challenge, and we just, at this point, we don't know. But Depends yeah, what sector people are in. Agreed. Yeah. I think yeah, in agreed. hospitality, it might turn out to be just that in some cases. Yeah, we'll, 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 yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Kevin, uh, last but definitely not least, mate. Apologies right, for mate. leaving. But apologies for leaving you uh, to the end. Uh, so you're sitting down with Martin Chile and Soraya. What are you saying to him? Basically, I think once you've, I'm presuming now we're at the stage where we review their business situation. Yeah. It would be first of all we look at themselves and the business. Secondly, we look at their mother-in-law situation. Uh, for every age two year old for me, you know, you've got to appreciate it and we're not looking at care. You'll be amazed how many active minded 80 year olds there are. 100%. So you've got to be careful on that. But you've then got to say, how's the intergeneration coming down? Why is she considering moving? Does she want the stress of it? Or does she take the more straightforward and profitable way that she can live with a warm hand rather than cold hand situation with lifetime mortgage? Guaranteed that she lives in the property. I suppose the other, and, and I've got clients we look after who are in this position, you know, they don't require care, but they move into like a McCarthy and Stone start, style setup, which is a bit more sort of retirement community, like sort of approach with help if, if needed. And I think yeah. that might be an option for her, right? It is. It's very much like anything we can't say here, but you've got to look at the individual person, the family situation, and mentally and physically, we should be able to put with the stress and trying to try and sell the property. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that is, I mean, it, uh, apparent, that to be frank, too. Kev, it's a move that I've kicked into the long grass because I don't want to go through the pain of doing it. But, um, but yeah, no, that, that, that's, you know, it, it, do you want to, do you want to do it again uh, at that point? And Martin and Shirley, too early to say? For them, do you think Martin and Shirley? I, oh, most sorry, mate. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, 59, there's retirement interest only mortgage to look at. Uh, to be honest, you're looking at the half side and reality of it from the mother to take out lifetime mortgage and pass, and would be far more sensible than them taking out 59. And how uh, would you manage that? How would you manage that conversation around life expectancy? Because, because 82, uh, might be, uh, might be a sort of you know, from an IHC plan perspective, I'd have concerns about that. Yeah, what you don't look at is obviously natural statistics for you to alongside uh, on normal side of it, projection side. Yeah. It all comes down to what's most important on this side. And if they've looked at their business correctly and spoken to the fellow professionals who, who said they should not be lifetime or at least another five years, especially yeah. since by that time, the mother may have passed on, been released at age, and then it's a completely different scenario. Yeah. Okay, cool. Good stuff. And that was another uh, uh, Cervello Inner Circle. Thanks for everybody for coming along. As always, I've learned loads. Um, hopefully you have too. Um, we'll have another one in May. Have we set a date for May yet, Russ? Russ isn't around. He's gone. Oh, he's gone. Left already. oh he's back. He's back. <laughs> It's May 19th. May 19th invite, is the next uh, one. The invite to going out at three o'clock. <laughs> is, is that efficient? We know when the invites are going out already. Everybody needs a rust. Um, so, yeah, uh, uh, we'll see you next week for another another case study. What we are doing, though, is um, we're going to invite one of you who can attend to do a sort of small five, ten minute presentation as part of the Inner Circle case study. Uh, Raz will let you know who that's going to be and I'll make sure there's a juicy bit in in, in the case study that, that fits your particular sector. 
Um, have a lovely remainder of April. Enjoy the sunshine, and I'll uh, speak to you soon. Thank you very Bye. much, Chris. Thank you Bye. very Bye. much. Bye. Thanks, Chris. Bye. 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 Bye.